Okay, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Martin Van Scheindel. Um, he's an assistant professor of linguistics at Cornell University. Professor Van Scheindel is a computational psycholinguist who studies the relationships between computational language models and psycholinguistic data, such as reading times. He also studies neural network representations of language to understand what aspects of language can be learned from language statistics directly without having experiences in the real world. Marty has been at Cornell since 2019, but before that he was a postdoc in cognitive science at Johns Hopkins, received his PhD in linguistics in 2017 from The Ohio State University. Um, but most importantly, before all of that, Marty was a student here at Western where he majored in linguistics, graduating in 2009, and was uh, one of our star students. So in today's talk, Balancing Input and Imagination, Dr. Van Scheindel will discuss computational and experimental psycholinguistic work that explores the trade-offs humans make between predictive processing and incorporating different types of linguistic input, phonotactic, syntax, and discourse during incremental, incremental language comprehension. So um, please feel free to put questions in the chat for those on Zoom. Um, at the end, we'll have time for some Q&A um, and either um, at that point you can raise your virtual or your actual hand and we'll have some conversation. Right? Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Marty. Thank you. Um, I'm going to share a screen, hopefully sharing the correct screen. Uh, and then see if I can get my notes back. All right. Can you guys see my screen, but not my notes? That'd be cool. Yes. Perfect. Um, so huh? there we go. All right. So um, yeah, uh, I um, as, as was mentioned, um, I, you know, have this uh, kind of career trajectory where I went from Western through Ohio State. Uh, uh, thankfully, uh, Ann Lobeck uh, strongly recommended to take a look at Ohio State, and it was a, it was a great school uh, for grad school, and then uh, postdoc at Johns Hopkins, and then uh, now I'm at Cornell. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to, if there are students who want to chat about that or different decisions that were made along that way. I'm happy to meet one on one in addition to discussion about the, the work. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to be uh, exploring how the language processor, uh, human language processor balances its, its goals, right? So the primary goal of language processing during comprehension is to take in language as input and extract meaning. And there are a few ways that it could pursue that objective. So one way is that it could wait until it observes language, and then it could spend the effort that it needs to decode that language into meaning, right? So it could see cats, and then it could say, oh, that's a noun phrase, and then it could say sleep, and then it could say, okay, verb phrase, and that's, it's great. That's a sentence, right? So um, you could build up, uh, you know, uh, as you receive input, you can expend the effort you need to integrate that in the thing you just saw into your kind of ongoing understanding of what's happening. Uh, but language is noisy, and so you could miss part of the signal. And then in that case, you would just be waiting a long time because you would miss part of it. Um, or uh, it can happen very quickly. And so you may be processing something, and then you get a bunch more input, and you don't have time to process all of it. right? So another version of this would be that you predict what you're going to receive. Right. So in this case, maybe you say, you know, I expect to see a sentence uh, and I expect that to have, you know, a subject and a verb. And then as I get the input, I just plug those into the slots that I've pre-allocated. Right. So I say, OK, cats and sleep. Um, and that means that I have to do less work online because I've done more of the work up front. Right. Um, and, you know, different uh, processing theories kind of hypothesize different balances of these. Um, but so what I'm going to talk about today is going to be kind of exploring the relationship between this balance, um, at least with the, the first the first project I'm going to talk about. So, uh, you know, for top down processing, we actually have a pretty nice measure of the extent to which humans are predicting the upcoming input. So this uh, measure is surprisal. Um, and it, you know, reflects the improbability of the event 
uh, that you just saw. So in this equation here, we have the probability of a word at time t given the words that came before it, right? And then we apply this negative log to that probability, um, which uh, helps quantify the extent to which a rational processor will uh, assign probabilities. So it helps kind of distort the probabilities in a way that makes them a little bit more um, uh, map better onto human processing, according to information theory. So the surprisal measure is nice because it's very easy to compute, right? It's just the probability of a word given the preceding words. And in particular, most kind of modern computational models uh, are trained to exactly generate this probability. Their, their primary goal is to generate uh, surprisal effectively. And so, you know, chat GPT, other kinds of uh, models that you may have heard of, they're explicitly just trained to generate surprisal values effectively. Um, but we've been using these types of models called language models for decades. You know, in earlier versions were help break some of the codes during World War II, for example. Um, and they just directly compute this value. So it's easy to get. And we sort of know that it uh, corresponds to human behavior. There's a number of studies that have shown that surprisal maps very nicely onto human behavior. So we have you know, some early work um, that shows that uh, surprisal can predict when you will say optional words or not. So if something is really surprising, then you'll include those optional words to help uh, smooth the uh, information load. Uh, and if something is very predictable, then you'll drop those optional words. Um, you know, it, uh, surprisal predicts how eyes move when we're reading. Um, some other work by the same group shows that uh, surprisal affects the duration of spoken words. So more surprising words are pronounced longer than less surprising words. Uh, surprisal predicts the N400 amplitude. So it predicts the um, size of the uh, like neural firing spikes in the brain. Uh, and you, it predicts um, uh, blood flow and uh, oxygenation of the blood. Uh, which enables us to kind of map out which parts of the brain are being used at different time points, right? There's even studies showing uh, correlating sweat pore dilation with surprisal. So as things are very surprising, your sweat pores start to dilate, you're kind of preparing to sweat because you're sort of under pressure, the difficulty of the language processing. Um, and so what all of these studies show is that high surprisal correlates with larger measures of processing difficulty. You know, higher surprisal equals longer reading, equals larger neural firing spikes, equals more oxygen consumption in the brain, equals increased sweating, et cetera. So the fact that surprisal correlates so well with human behavioral measures is great because we have this measure, it's very easy to compute, and it correlates with a lot of the things that humans are doing when they're processing language. Um, Okay, and so that's nice. And so this sort of has led to a kind of implicit assumption, I think, in a lot of the computational psycholinguistics uh, that sort of says that maybe top-down prediction uh, can fully account for human behavior in reading language processing. So, you know, obviously this is kind of a cartoon, but this is sort of um, an assumption, I would argue, in a lot of work now that says, actually, this kind of surprisal measure can just predict human behavior. Like all we're doing is predicting and confirming those predictions. Um, and so uh, I'm going to be talking about work that I did with Tal Lindzen, where we um, sort of explored this idea. Um, so in this study, we were looking at uh, garden path sentences. So if you're not familiar with these, uh, you know, this is a sentence, the horse race past the barn fell. And if you're not familiar with these, then you basically don't think this is a valid sentence, usually. Um, the actual sort of correct interpretation of the sentence is that the horse which was raced past the barn fell, or sometimes you can get it if you say, there were a lot of horses racing, the horse raced past the barn fell, right? Um, and so the reason, that, so it, usually what happens is when people get the word fell in the garden path, uh, version of the sentence, they slow way down. They don't know what's going on. They spend a long time reading fell. All of the measures I talked about spike at that point. Um, and so, you know, what's going on? Well, you can think of this that there's two possible parses. In one version, 
the um, you know the sentence is the horse race past the barn, and the next thing you're going to see is a period, right? Or end of sentence somehow. The other version is that you still need a verb because you're talking about the horse that was raced past the barn did something, right? And if you adopt the interpretation where there's the sentence is complete, then the parse will fail, right? And that parse is more common, the parse on the left, than the right parse, which means that usually people will adopt the left parse and that's why they are getting this garden path effect, right? And so what we were interested in in this work is looking at what are the actual mechanisms producing this garden path effect. So uh, one version, the kind of older model, is this serial tree surgery model. That's my name for it, but it shows up a lot. Um, and it's basically the idea that what's happening is you are adopting an interpretation of the sentence as you read it. Then you get fell, which is inconsistent with your interpretation of what's happening. So some part of your brain goes through and identifies the parts of the parse that are inconsistent with this new input and you know somehow chops them out and then uh, and then builds new structure in order to incorporate that uh, that new observation. And so uh, crucially, what this uh, model is saying is that the uh, the processing cost of incorporating fell, is not directly related to the probability of fell following the other stuff. It's the fact that you picked the wrong parse is because the fell, the correct, uh, you know, reduced relative interpretation was less common, was less frequent. So surprise it led you to pick the, the, uh, the, the wrong parse. But once you did that, the amount of repair that you have to do is not tied to surprisal. Right. It's it's tied to however much effort it is to use these tree surgery mechanisms. Um, the other uh, kind of model that's out there is this parallel, fully parallel re-ranking model, which is the model that is adopted usually in computational psycholinguistics. And in this version, what's going on is that you have, uh, you know, you actually maintain all of the possible parses of what you could what you could be uh, perceiving. And what's happening is that you have more resources, more cognitive resources allocated to the more probable parse. Um, and then what happens is you get, so you have the more probable parse, uh, which is expecting end of sentence, and you have the less probable parse with less resources that's expecting a verb phrase. And then you get fell, which is only consistent with the less probable parse. And so you have to reallocate your probability mass in your brain uh, from the now invalid parse to the apparently correct parse. And the amount of probability mass you need to reallocate is the effort that you need to expend to get the correct reading. And this means that surprisal itself will tell you how difficult it is for somebody to repair the structure because you have to go, you have to reallocate, you know, 80% of the probability mass. Well, then however long that's gonna take is how long it takes you to reallocate 80% of the probability mass. So if you know how long that takes, you could directly predict how much someone will be surprised by a garden path effect. Right. Um, and there, there are a few other theories uh, of, of processing as well, but I'm gonna kind of focus on these two as the two sort of extremes in the, in the literature. Um, and the key here is that if in the second model, surprisal can directly predict the amount of difficulty people experience in these kinds of constructions, right? And that would imply that the parser is very much relying on these top-down predictions rather than other sorts of things. Okay. And so, you know, uh, a lot of work, uh, including work out of my group has shown that language models, surprisal can predict garden path existence, right? Um, and specifically, uh, People have known for a while that um, syntactic parsers can predict garden path existence. So in this case, we're showing that these kind of language models can do so as well. Great. So surprisal can predict the fact that people will garden path. And what we're interested in is whether or not surprisal can also predict the amount of uh, difficulty people have when they garden path. But this is tricky because surprisal is in bits, right? This kind of log domain. And people read in milliseconds, not in bits. So we need a way to map bits of information to milliseconds of reading time. And luckily, we have a previous paper. I mean, not my paper, but there is a previous paper 
showing that actually there's a few that show that uh, surprisal can linearly uh, uh, is linearly related to reading times. So what we have in this graph is along the x-axis of each of the um, uh, of each of the uh, 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 subplots, we have the probability of something, and we see that as the probability gets larger, then it takes less time to read something, right? And so in that first subplot, we have how much the surprisal of the current word influences your reading time of that word. Then we have in the next subplot, how much the surprisal of the previous word influences your reading of this word, and then how much it influences two words later and three words later. So you see there's kind of this delay where surprisal is kind of continuing to impact you, which means that the reading time of a particular word is a linear combination of its own surprisal and the surprisal of the previous word and the surprisal of two words ago and the surprisal of, of three words ago, and actually more, but you get decreasing returns. So that's great. What that means is that if we can find these linear factors, we can directly predict, if surprisal is, is all that there is, we can directly predict the amount of reading time people will have at a given time point using this linear combination uh, and measures of surprisal. So where do we get the measures of surprisal from? Uh, I used two different models. Um, these are both neural network models. Um, we can go into details about them if you want, but the, the important thing is that they're both trained on uh, they're trained on two different kinds of data. So one is trained on Wikipedia data, and one is trained on soap opera transcripts. Uh, why? Because Wikipedia data, as a kind of encyclopedia, um, contains a lot of complex constructions. What we are looking at in Garden Path Effects is the unexpectedness of certain complex constructions. Those constructions are overrepresented in Wikipedia, which means that a Wikipedia-based model is likely to underestimate the difficulty people will have with complex or long sentences. Uh, conversely, soap operas, while they have convoluted plots, do not tend to have long, uh, at least soap opera you know, uh, sentences, tend not to be overly long or syntactically complex, right? So they might they may, uh, overestimate the difficulty, right? Which gives us this nice bound that we would expect that, if anything, the Wikipedia model should underestimate the difficulty people have, and the soap opera model might overestimate, but that gives us a nice bound, uh, a, nice, uh, a, a nice bounds that we can say, well, the human effect is probably somewhere between a soap opera transcript and an encyclopedia, right? Um, okay. So that we can get, we can use these two models to extract surprisals. Uh, and then we need to find those linear uh, factors. And so for that, I just took, other reading time data that does not include uh, garden path sentences and found, you know, across all of this reading time of uh, what 80 sentences or about 224 participants uh, and then controlling for things like word length and things like that, how much of an impact does the surprisal of the current word have on the reading time and the surprisal of the previous word and surprisal so I can get that linear combination. And then I can take that to our garden path sentences or to any corpus and say, okay, according to surprisal, how much reading time should we expect for each of these words? And then uh, we tested this on um, three different kinds of garden path sentences. So we tested this on NPS sentences, like uh, the woman saw the doctor wore a hat, where saw initially people interpret it as having a noun phrase compliment the doctor, and but it turns out it has a sentential compliment that the doctor wore a hat, and so people need to reanalyze it at wore a hat. Uh, we have NPZ garden paths, when the woman visited her nephew, laughed loudly, right? So here, uh, people initially think that her nephew is the complement of visited, but in fact, visited is intransitive. And so when they get laughed loudly, they don't have a subject to attach. Uh, and then we have the main verb reduced relative that I've already talked about. And what we're looking at in all three of these constructions is the difference in, you know, in reading times or in surprisal at that disambiguation point where people realize that something is wrong, right? And we compare the difference, like how hard is it to process the horse race past the barn fell in the garden path version versus the horse which was raced past the barn fell. The difference between those two reading times is called the garden path effect. And so in this case, we're gonna, you know, estimate that using our linear combination of surprisals at that time point from our two models. And so what we end up with 
is this. So uh, we see that for NPS, neither of the models, pink is the Wikipedia model, green is the soap opera model, and blue is the human reading times uh, at the Garden Path site. We see that neither model is able to predict this, uh, this effect. Um, and moreover, we see there's not a ton of difference between a Wikipedia-based model and a, and a uh, soap opera model, surprisingly. And the same is true for the other constructions. So um, first off, we sort of can conclude that this is not a function of the training data because we kind of picked two different kinds of model training data that are radically different. And so, so it suggests that this isn't a function of like, oh, we should have picked a different kind of data because the kind of data doesn't really seem to matter in terms of the model predictions. Um, we can also see that there isn't really a linear scaling that will work. So you could say maybe our uh, linear um, uh, factors that we use to map surprisal onto reading times was were wrong, and we need to, you know, make them bigger or something. But that's not going to work because NPZ and MVRR are harder than NPS, but the models find them easier to process. So even if you scale up the NPS model predictions, uh, it will still underpredict the NPZ and MVRR. And if you scale up NPZ and MVRR, you're going to overpredict the NPS. There's not really a good way to get the right, uh, the right sort of pattern here. And subsequent work has followed up on this and shown that actually we were sort of being overly generous to the models, and the models are actually do actually even worse than <laughs> than what we said in this paper. But um, so. This sort of concludes uh, the way we, we 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 conclude that there are human factors beyond predictability, right? There's possibly syntactic repair mechanisms that we don't have access to in the data. And this is a problem for computational modeling because it means that there are parts of the processor that you will not be able to see in data. And this is partly because uh, we train models um, based on you know actual language data. And that means that we only have access to kind of production data. <laughs> we don't have access to the, st to the comprehension statistics or the comprehension process, really. Um, and so, you know, in terms of machine learning or this kind of stuff, we're, we're going to have a really hard time getting access to that because people don't generate their tree repairs when they're generating language. Um, for the purposes of this talk, um, it also suggests that the processor relies more on bottom-up processing than is generally assumed in computational linguistics because there is less, it's not fully parallel predicting every possible thing it could be seeing at once top-down, right? So that means that there is more uh, bottom-up um, processing that is resulting in changes to that top-down structure that you're predicting. And so in the next section of the talk, I'm going to talk about ongoing work with my PhD student, John Starr, um, and this is ongoing work. So if there's feedback, you know, um, I would, uh, you know, be happy to incorporate it so we can make the work stronger. Uh, so while the previous section of the talk probes the extent of top-down processing in humans, then this work, we're looking at the extent to which humans balance different kinds of input signals. Okay. Take a drink of water here. So there are a number of different ways that different uh, aspects of the input could interact, right? So a classic model called the sausage model might look like this, right? Where you get the input, a delegate arrived, she registered, right? And what you need to do is you need to first figure out what the words are, do some phonological processing, and then you take the words that you've extracted from the signal and you fit them into a syntactic structure. And then you try to figure out the meaning relations between those things, right? And then that gives you the overall concept that was trying to be conveyed. But there's a lot of evidence that this is not the right kind of model because minimally you can think that syntax and semantics have a pretty interactive relationship between them. We can see this in cases of like semantic roles where the subject of a sentence is usually gonna convey information about the doer of the event, things like this. Um, so maybe what we have is something like this, where after phonological processing and lexical access, the syntax and the semantics inform each other, right? 
Um, and then together they sort of form the concept that you get. But um, in this work, we were wondering whether syntax and semantics could also inform your phonological processing. Um, and that's often conceived, like phonological processing is often conceived of as preceding the syntactic processing because presumably it gives you access to the words that you're dealing with to plug into the syntactic structure. Um, and one of my previous PhD students, Katie Blake, also did work in this space and found that um, in French and Italian, syntactic and semantic uh, information would influence phonological uh, uh, preferences in French and Italian. So inspired by that, we were wondering whether the processing actually looks something like this. So processing may be fully interactive where people get the input and then they have to balance their attention across kind of phonological processing and syntactic processing and semantic processing and uh, discourse processing. And based on um, the strength of different cues in each of those signals, they sort of will latch on to different bits of each of those things and weight them differently. Um, and so we chose uh, two well-studied phenomena here. So we chose phonotactic acceptability ratings, uh, like the fact that in English, people think that blick is an acceptable uh, nonce word, and they think that benick is a is not not a valid possible English word. Um, and irreversible binomial ordering preferences. So the fact that people prefer salt and pepper to pepper and salt. Um, and uh, from what we can tell, there a lot of work has studied these two things, but not a lot has studied the extent to which um, these judgments are influenced by syntactic uh, structures, by discourse context, um, and so we were wanting to explore the extent to which these things could be pushed around using different uh, uh, syntactic and, and discourse contexts. Um, and in my group, we tend to think in terms of events. And so, um, you know, the idea is that language conveys information about events. And so you can expand on an event uh, either by giving additional information within a sentence or by giving additional information in the discourse you're kind of still expanding uh, uh, the, the knowledge of that event uh, in either case. And so we have something like, we believe the trap went outside. We were so hungry, we didn't notice at first. Okay. Uh, where the, you know, some, some context comes after, or a case where there was a hush to the crowd, the groom and bride were gone. And so, uh, in, in this case, I'm going to explain three experiments. So in experiment 1A, um, we ran a self-paced reading experiment. So pause, self-paced reading, what is that? Uh, self-paced reading is where you show people one word at a time. Uh, when they hit the space bar or some other key, then that word goes away and a new word uh, appears on the screen. Um, they can tell kind of how many words they're going to have to read because there's a lot of like dashes on the screen that are obscuring the words, but they can only read one word at a time. Um, so this is a pretty common experimental paradigm for uh, like uh, online studies because it's very easy for people to hit spacebar and for us to get kind of reading times using this rather than trying to use their webcams to track where their eyes are looking. Um, but you might ask, well, if you're interested in something like phonological processing, why are you using reading times? Uh, again, it, there uh, I guess two reasons. One, self-paced reading is uh, relatively easier, or I don't know, easier, but it is easy to do online. Um, and then in addition, there's been a lot of literature showing that people produce phonological effects when reading. And uh, in fact, a lot of the work that, that uh, John Starr uh, has done up to this point, um, we've been looking at like rhyming and humor, which both involve heavy phonological uh, components. Uh, and we study those using reading times and we get similar effects to spoken. And so we sort of just, in this, we're just using um, reading times, but we can discuss further in questions. So we ran a self-paced reading experiment where participants read uh, two word or two sentence passages. Okay. So they hear one of these two kinds of sentences. So they hear, uh, there was a music festival all week. And then they read, last night, the blick smashed through the window. Okay. 
So what's going on in this? We basically have three choice points in this experiment. Right? We, we manipulate whether the nonce word blick or benick is viable or, or unviable. We manipulate whether the sentence is either a matrix sentence, like last night the blick smashed through the window, or is an embedded structure. We thought the blick smashed through the window, where there's both a thinking event and then embedded within that is the smashing through the window event. And then we have uh, two discourse contexts. One where it's there's meaningful context. There was a loud crashing sound nearby. Then the blick smashed through the window, right? Or uh, just something else that's uh, kind of random and isn't related, uh, where there's a music festival all week and the blick smashed through the window. And then what we wanted, so we manipulated all of these in a two by two by two design. And what we uh, found, well, I guess to show you what we found, uh, I'm going to show the results here. All of the constructions uh, or all of the all the stimuli have the nonce word at sentence position four in the sentence. So we can analyze uh, word four in each of our experimental sentences to see the effect of the nonce word. Um, and words three through the end of the sentence are always identical across the, the conditions. So um, what we can do is we can look and see whether people show a difference in reading times between Blick and Benick, right? So here, what we see is, uh, and we're going to look at positions four and five. So that's at Blick or Benick and the next word. Because if you remember, the uh, you know effective surprisal kind of spills over across, um, uh, or the effective surprisal, I mean, generally, the effect of processing spills over to subsequent words. So we're looking at positions four and five here. And what we see is that in the case where you have a matrix sentence, so it's not embedded syntax, uh, and it's meaningful discourse context, you get that Benick is worse than, than uh, Blick. Okay? The red line is above the blue line significantly at this point. And you don't get this in the case where you have embedded uh, embedded syntax and meaningful uh, discourse. And we also get the same kind of effect at, at Blick or Benick when, uh, when you have random discourse context. Um, and so what we can... What we conclude from this is that phonotactic judgments arise in matrix syntactic uh, in matrix uh, syntax frames. Um, no phonotactic judgments arise in the uh, embedded syntax frames, and um, the actual kind of discourse context uh, didn't have any effect. There was no; it didn't matter whether the discourse context was uh, meaningful or it was random. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. So kind of summarize, phonotactic judgments only su surface in matrix clauses and not in embedded clauses, and the type of discourse context did not matter. So then we thought, well, um, you know, what happens if we, if we get rid of the discourse context? And we didn't want to fully get rid of the discourse context because um, there might be an effect of in, if we got rid of it, there would be a lot fewer of those dashes on the screen for people to see. So we kept it, but we swapped the order. So now we give the target sentence first, and then we give the context sentence. So it shouldn't help their processing of Blick or Benick. It's just happening later. So the same number of dashes are on the screen, but the you know discourse is happening after the target. So last night, the Blick smashed through the window. There was a loud crashing sound nearby. Um, and so now we're just manipulating whether there's a viable or, or non-viable nonce word, and whether the uh, Syntactic uh, configuration is a matrix sentence or an embedded sentence. Okay. And what we found is that uh, when there was a matrix, uh, when, when, the, when it was occurring in a matrix condition, um, we saw the effect, the word after the nonce. Whereas in the embedded syntax condition, we saw the effect at the nonce. And this is kind of interesting because that's similar to what we saw before in the matrix condition, but when there was discourse, okay, where the effect happens at the nonce rather than the next word. 
So it looks like in the simplest case, uh, where there is either simple syntax, where there's simple syntax and there's no discourse, the uh, the fun the fun attacky processing happens later, and then when we embed it either in syntax or in discourse, the phonological processing is shifted to occur earlier. Um, and, you know, remember earlier where I said the actual kind of discourse didn't make a difference, whether it was meaningful or random, it just seems like the simple existence of discourse context influences the phonotactic timing, suggesting that the processor prioritizes easier cues earlier. Okay. Um, so in other words, the phonotactic judgments are delayed when not embedded in any context. Uh, one layer of syntactic embedding patterns with one layer of discourse embedding and the type of discourse context doesn't matter, but the existence of it influences phonotactic processing. Okay, and then we thought, well, <clears throat> does this just apply to phonotactics or does this sort of behavior also extend to more abstract ordering preferences in larger structures? So for this, we looked at uh, the same, same deal, self-paced reading. Um, we looked at binomials. So we have a sentence like, there was an accident in the kitchen. Yesterday morning, the bread and butter fell off the counter, or the butter and bread fell off the counter. And um, we first normed these. So we asked people to uh, you know, tell us if they had a preference between butter and bread and bread and butter. We normed these a few different ways. And we kept uh, all of the items where there was a, at least a 96% preference for one of the orders. So people really like one of these orders. And if you do this with uh, reading times, also just showing them, they read the, the you know, correct or the, the, the canonical um, version a lot faster. And then what we manipulated were these three things. So we manipulated whether we were showing the, the preferred order or the dispreferred order, whether we showed it in a matrix or an embedded clause, and whether the uh, whether it was occurring before or after the context. Or in other words, whether there was no context or it happened after a discourse context. Um, and so what we have is something like, here, here's an example of a preferred order binomial in a matrix clause occurring in no context. So we thought that the bread and butter fell off the counter. There was a crash in the room. And what we're going to uh, analyze are the binomial itself, bread and butter, and then the three spillover words after that. And uh, what we end up finding is that we don't see the exact same pattern as with phonotactics, but this is a different phenomenon, so it's not so surprising. But the key is that we only see an effect of the of of showing the dispreferred order when there is no uh, when there's uh, matrix syntax and there is no discourse context in all the other conditions we don't see an effect people don't have a strong preference of uh, wanting to see bread and butter instead of butter and bread um, and this is even though we filtered our binomials to be irreversible where there was otherwise a ninety six percent preference to choose the one order over the other right as soon as you put this in context. It seems the processor reprioritizes how it handles the processing of the binomials. Um, and so this suggests that the, the processor is kind of yeah, reallocating uh, how it attends to these input streams. Yeah. And these two charts uh, that I'm pointing arrows to now are the two that other we, we also saw effects in the uh, phonotactics case. So in conclusion, um, you know, we, despite strong ordering preferences, we don't see preferences when they're placed in any kind of syntax or discourse embedding. Uh, and the processor, that means the processor changes how it processes binomials based on the syntax and the discourse streams. So in conclusion, uh, this work uh, shows that humans balance competing input streams and seem to prioritize easier streams earlier. Um, in addition, uh, event processing interacts online with phonotactic and irreversible binomial processing, um, and that the syntax and the discourse processing give rise to similar kinds of effects, so, which kind of supports theories that ascribe similar representations uh, or processing to syntax and discourse. And so thanks to my co-authors, Tal Linsen and John Saar, to my lab, Seaside and to Cornell NLP. 
Um, and thank you guys. Thanks, Marty. We will open it up for questions, the Zoom room or the Miller Hall 154. So if um, you're um, in Zoom, go ahead and just um, unmute and ask. Anybody can also send a chat. faces I haven't seen for a long time. Sam's here. I have a question, maybe. Yes, go Jordan. Okay. Um, I, I took a note when you said uh, people don't generate tree repairs in their production. And so we don't have mm. uh, computational data on uh on their on their production of that. Because you were thinking about the Wikipedia and the soap opera stuff, and I was, you know, noting that yeah, we don't we don't produce those like in writing that make it into final drafts, maybe of soap operas or into the what remains on um, Wikipedia. What if it was, um, you know, spoken corpora extemporaneous? Would we then find, you know, because in speech disfluencies, we do see corrections to, uh, you know, sentences. We start one way and then we not, you know prototypical garden pathy kinds of things, but similar types of, I'm rebuilding my tree structure here. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a that's a great point. I mean, I guess you probably would see repairs if people were trying to recover, uh, recall uh, how to do a garden path also on, on the fly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I don't know, I, I don't know if speech repairs end up being the same as comprehension repairs, I guess. That would be interesting. Um, but yeah, I think, I guess what I would say is as far as, so I think that it's possible to study the repair mechanisms. Um, I don't know with, I guess what I'm uh, trying to argue against when I say that is that one of the, uh, since I operate in kind of the natural language processing, computational linguistics world, um, a lot of times the argument there is that, well, you just don't have enough data. You could just add more novels or Wikipedia or this kind of stuff to it. Um, you're right that uh, I think if you specifically like targeted speech errors or something, you might be able to try and learn a kind of repair mechanism there for speech production. I don't know whether that would generalize to comprehension production, but I think it, that's a really interesting question. I have a question that's like very broad. Um, earlier, like way at the beginning, I also don't know a lot about this topic at all, just to preface my question. Um, earlier at the beginning, you were talking about, you know, surprisal and the, the findings people have found with that. And you mentioned a study that shows that people are more likely to use optional words when it's like high surprisal. Um, so that's about production, right? Like if there's something that I don't have to put in there, I'm more likely to put it in there if it's, you know, high mm -hmm. surprise. Um, and I just like, it was just interesting because you, oh, your uh, research that you talked about today is really about processing. And I'm wondering if you can just comment a little bit more on like, I mean, I guess this kind of gets a joint question too, but this like production versus processing thing is very interesting. And you're speaking to a field working semanticist here, so. That's the context. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think um, so. This is a uh, so this is this is something that I've been arguing for for several years. Is that um, what I think a lot of computational modeling people would like is a model of comprehension, and so they train. You know, a lot of the tasks that we have are comprehension, where you're trying to read something and understand it, or you're trying to guess the entailments that something has, or things like this. So a lot of the tasks are comprehension focused. Um, you're trying to read something and summarize it, right? Um, but the only data that the models have is production data. And so 
I think like the the optional uh, use of that or things like this are production effects. And so the models do a good job of modeling that because the data is production focused. Um, and what I, you know, for example, one of my previous students, Forrest Davis, uh, did a lot of stuff with ProDrop. And it was like in ProDrop, the problem is that with ProDrop, you, you um, use ProDrop in the cases where it would be understood what the referent is. Um, and so the only time people don't use ProDrop is when it's the surprising case. But the models see that as the only case where you see. So they see that as the default case. Right. So it's like the models learn the exact opposite bias of what they should learn because they're learning from the things that are stated overtly. And humans have this like background that like, oh, if it's said, it's being said because I need to know it because it's going against the bias. Whereas the models learn that bias directly. And then I think that is the default interpretation that humans have. Um, and so that ends up hurting them in these kinds of cases. Yeah, I wonder, I mean, I just all this is like bringing to mind like just general pragmatic reasoning that we do, like both when we're interpreting what people say to us, but also in production, right? Um, so like we have choices about how to say things, but we take into account what people, how people are likely to process the when we're producing the kind of that interplay. But I think you're right, it's like kind of gets missed in the computation models bit. Like the kind of rational human behavior, I guess. Anyway, that's not like a question, just like mildly very inspiring. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's an interesting dilemma as to how you get it. And I think like now um, some of the implicit um, acknowledgement of that comes from the fact that now like a lot of the big models like ChatGPT and stuff are trained. You show people this, you say, is this what you meant? And then they say yes or no. Like you're trying to get that feedback because the comprehension part isn't present just in Wikipedia or whatever you're training on. It's got to be through this kind of like interactive process of asking people their comprehension judgments. <laughs> Sam, did you unmute? I did very briefly. Uh, thank you so much. This was such an awesome talk. I'm always delighted to see what you're working on. I've obviously been a fan of your work for like 20 years now, which is an insane number to throw out loud. Um, so I am also somebody who's struggling with how uh, much explicit structure to include in a model versus, you know, uh, you know, the large language model approach of assuming it's it's emergent from the data. So I'm really uh, uh, just delighted to see this work. Um, I really don't know how to address this dilemma either of like the the classic how do you model the I language from the E language, right? How do you take what's external in a production and assume the comprehension. Cause I'm thinking of domains in which that's done like uh, developmental or child language. And that requires a behavior that then we make assumptions off of what structure we think exists based on that behavior. And without, you know, chat GPT able to <laughs> turn its head and look at something or listen to something like a child can. And I just don't know. Um, this all leads me to a, a really uh, uh, kind of random question. Do you, you have any uh, inkling or do you know of any work that um, tries to build an iterative understanding in which it's you start with sort of more simple data, much like a child might, and let the model master that before moving on to more complicated structures as opposed to uh, you know receiving all of this at once? And is that a suitable way to simulate uh, the building up of an I language. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think one of the, so the the push from the NLP side, the natural language processing side, is that one of the problems with these big models is they consume so much data. They require so much data to get any kind of traction. And so from the engineering angle, it's very attractive, I think, to try and figure out how how do kids learn because they do it with a lot less data but arguably i mean you know they do it with different kinds of data but they do it with a lot less language data and so how can we can we use that as inspiration to make the models more efficient rather than just burning through years of compute time to get whatever um 
And I think, uh, so, so there is recent, there was recently a challenge called the baby LM challenge. I don't know if you saw this at, uh, at the tunnel, um, natural language learning conference where they had this, they always had a shared task, a kind of a competition. And so in this case, it was the baby LM challenge. And so it was, can you, what can you learn from a relatively small amount of data? Um, and the winning systems, uh, it was sort of one of these examples where it was kind of like the winning systems did things that were maybe um, less sophisticated than you would hope. And they were able to get traction using kind of um, methods that are probably don't generalize very well. And so I think there is interest in this, uh, especially from the efficiency and training perspective. Uh, but, and, and there is interest in this also, I guess I should say, I know some work doing like speech um, where they try and like from speech data kind of slowly um, learn categories. So you try and learn phonological categories or phonetic categories from speech and you do that iteratively. And what those have found that the models are very expensive to train, more expensive than language models, but they do give rise to kind of similar clusterings of the kinds of um, errors that children make. Um, so there is interest in it, but I don't, it's not outpacing the language model. Um, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so when you mentioned pro drop and surprisal, it kind of makes me think of the interface hypothesis and bilinguals like difficulty with like topic shift and non-topic shift and just processing on interfaces. Um, and I, I'm not super familiar with computational linguistics, but I am quite familiar with psycholinguistics. Um, and I I just wonder if, I don't know what you mentioned about ProDrop, like, could you model the interface? Like, could you use computational modeling to like further investigate the interface hypothesis? Um. Yeah, I guess, can you, what, so can you elaborate? What is the interface hypothesis? Oh yeah. Um, so it's a L2 sentence processing theory, which basically posits that L2 speakers are going to have more difficulty processing on like syntax semantics interfaces or syntax pragmatics interfaces. And it kind of breaks these interfaces up into internal and external based on like if it's metalinguistic or like discourse pragmatic. Um, but it was put forth because of data with bilinguals who were like Spanish English or um, Italian English and the bilinguals who had more exposure to English, which is of course not a pro drop language. They were more, they used the overt subject pronoun instead of a null pronoun in, was it non-topic shift? So the inappropriate like quote unquote context for that. Um, yeah, so I think, um... So I guess a, a short answer to your question is that I, well, I don't know if this is a short answer, but the, the, the problem I think, which gets at kind of the general um, theme maybe of the computational modeling discussion so far is that it's very hard to link a mistake that the model makes to a mistake that the humans make. Mm -hmm. And so um, that means that if you did try and explore it with the computational models, you would then potentially, it, would be, it might be hard to say, well, humans are making the same uh, mistake. That said, um, I do think that what, I think what the computational models are really good for is if you have uh, a computational model that includes some feature and then, and then another model that does not, you can directly compare how those two things react, right? I, that's harder to do with these like large language models, but if you have explicit, symbolic uh, components to your models where you turn this thing on and then it has different behavior, turn it off and it doesn't. Uh, I think that is where you can get mileage with the, the linking hypothesis. Um, to your point though, I think that it's a really interesting question about um, like, so let's say you had a model and you knew that the model knew ProDrop and the model also knew about uh, topic shift and the model also uh, like 
would you even then be able to link the behavior of the model to the person? Um, I think like, I guess the, I, I don't have a, I don't have an explicit answer for you, but I think probably what I would suggest is if you have a model where you have this kind of toggle and it ends up making a particular kind of error that humans also make, I guess I would want that model to make, uh, you know, uh, a pattern of behavior, which you could then take back and run a human experiment and see if the, if that additional behavior shows up in the humans, right? Then that would be, I think, more support for the idea that whatever this toggle was, was something that's going on in both models. Um, I think a lot of times people turn on something and they see it maps to human behavior. And then it's very hard to know if that's what they were looking for. They would have toggled something else until it finally matched human behavior. So I think it's um, something to be aware of when you're using these models. Didn't really answer your question. Just chatted around it. But. I think it, it kind of, yeah, it answered it. So thank you. Well, the uh, Miller Hall bells are ringing and the sun is setting in Ithaca. So, yeah. <laughs> oh wait, we've got one more though. Jordan has one more question. Um, Marty, a student of mine four years ago yeah. um, did some research on these um, frozen uh, binomials, uh, specifically thinking about um, two phonological factors, one syllables uh, and two vowel quality. Um, and two semantic factors, um, gender and age, uh, that okay. seem to be independently in the literature about you know what's motivating the order that they're showing up in, um, trying to weight them against one another, basically. If we make a conflict between a semantic one and a phonological one, which one wins? Yeah. Um, through a, um, a contextual picture I saw in a frame, X and Y, where yeah. the X and Y mapped onto pictures that had those different semantic properties and the words that were given, the nonce words for them had those different phonological qualities. Would you be interested in me sending that to you? Would that potentially be helpful? Yeah, please. That would be great. Thank you. I'll find. I'll find. And that's Eli George's. Eli. It should be through the Cedar, Cedar yeah. um, accessible through the library because it was an honors project. Right. Yeah. Eli George. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Okay. We may. We may actually have read this, but I. Yeah, I'd be happy to take a look again. Um, thank you. Yeah. Right. This feels like a, a family reunion with Grace and Sam and Marty all here. So I don't know if you all overlapped with Grace, but she's in grad school now at, at University of Florida. Oh, and, okay. uh, is that right, Grace? Yeah. Um, and uh, bilingual and. Sorry, Grace, put you on the spot. Oh, yeah. Do you, the, are you talking about the oh, lab? I mean, your, yeah, your lab name. Oh, right. yeah. The Brain Language and Bilingualism Lab. Very cool. Yeah. Well, this was great. Thank you, Marty. Thanks was great. everyone for coming. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.